why do you think should be bothered by your topic for general public and research? Why bother about that? The, the, the reason I got involved was that I was, uh, I, I really had no choice because I had seen this, you know, as, as an adolescent at a time when I was forming my ideas about the world. And I couldn't think after that of, of anything more important than to know what that thing was. Because my first job was at Paris Observatory where I had access to uh, you know, private data from astronomers who had never reported before. And uh, I had also access to some of the early reports of the French Air Force, you know, where, and they, uh, they had seen all those things. So to me that said that the idea that the witnesses are lying, you know, was not, was not true. I, I, I knew it was not true. And that the, the idea that there were only a few cases, that wasn't true. We had just started to look at a small sample and that the real universe of data was much, much bigger. So the, it re, uh, the other thing that um, intrigued me was that it related to so many different fields you know, to, of course, to biology, to, you know, to medicine, to evolution, our evolution on the earth. What does it mean if there are creatures that uh, can breathe our air and they, they are three feet tall, uh, you know, coming out of an object where we don't understand the propulsion system? I mean, after that, um, you know, I can go through a career in science and uh, I've gone through actually two careers, you know, one in science, one as a as a internet entrepreneur, and then a third career as a venture capitalist, for you know where I've started a number of companies. That has the fact that I was public with my observation and my interest in UFOs has never stopped me. The last fund for which I was a general partner was a $65 million fund for NASA. The people at NASA who entrusted us with the money knew that I had written 12 books about UFOs. It didn't stop them because they, they could tell that I was serious about it and that I had done it you know, within the constraints of science you know, and within the discipline of science. Uh, again, uh, the, the field is open to speculation, but as a scientist, there are only certain things that you can do if you want to learn something. So that's what kept me going. And to my, I was surprised that I never had, you know, uh, it was it was never an obstacle in my career. But you know what I found uh, in dealing with um, people managing money, with the bankers, with the venture capitalists, the, the millionaires are skeptical. The billionaires are not. Okay? That's the difference. I'm curious to ask you in, in this phenomenon, UFO, and you have the first sighting, it was 95.5, and you mentioned the book. It has maybe effect in your personal and professional life. Till today, what kind of question you mind, maybe personally and professionally? Bigger question, or open question. So uh, the, I, I had a, a, an observation, a sighting, when I was about 14, 14 or 15, in uh, a, a small town close to Paris. Um, and uh, yes, it, it made an impact on me. I, I was studying physics and astronomy. I wanted to be an astronomer. I was excited about all the the new findings in science and so on. And, uh, but then one day I was uh, helping my, my father do some work inside the house. My mother was out in the garden, beautiful afternoon, sunshine, blue sky, no cloud in the sky. And my mother uh, called us to, uh, because she saw something in the sky that uh, she had never seen before. And 
I joined her in the yard, in the garden, and what I saw was a disc that was uh, motionless, uh, was apparently about half a kilometer away over a, a church uh, in, in, a, in that town. And there was a small dome on top of the, the disc, you know, a classical flying saucer. This was in 1955, uh, a year after a major wave of cases uh, all over France and Italy and Spain and so on over Western Europe. And um, the, it was not scary, it was fascinating. And I, I looked at it, and the, the object eventually moved away without a sound. The next day, I spoke to a friend of mine from school who was a very good physics student, and I told him about it, and he said he had seen the same thing from his house, which was um, about uh, another half kilometer away from us higher up the hill, and he had looked at it with binoculars. I asked him to draw it, and what he drew was exactly what I had seen. So there was no question about the object. There was no question there was something there, and we did not know what it was. Uh, my father told me that, well, there were many, this was a time when there, were, there was a lot of experiments with new types of aircraft, you know, the jet engines and you know, the jet uh, fighters and, and uh, of course, the, pas the first passenger jets were, were being developed. So there were lots of prototypes that people, and he said maybe that's a, just a new, a new thing. And we will know about it later when it's revealed. Well, um, it was never revealed. I mean, we still don't know what that kind of thing could be. And uh, even in, in terms of aerodynamics, the disk is uh, a fundamentally unstable structure uh, as, a, uh, no, as an aircraft. So um, when I, I grew up and uh, you know, achieved my degrees in science, and my first job was at uh, Paris Observatory, tracking the early satellites, you know, in the early 60s, 1960s, 61, um, there was still nothing like what I had seen. And then I found out that a number of scientists, a number of astronomers had also seen things like that, and they never reported it. So the idea that scientists never see UFOs was wrong. Scientists were seeing UFOs, but they were afraid of the stigma of reporting it, of being thought to be strange because they had these visions. The same thing, of course, for pilots. And pilots, um, you know, would be sent to uh, a number of tests and they would be sent to see psychiatrists if they reported seeing something like this. So I discovered that there was a lot of information by trained observers, by scientists, by technical people, by people in uh, aeronautics, and you know, of course in, by uh, astronomers as well, that had never been reported. And to me, that changed everything. So I never, I, I decided never to hide the fact that I had seen this, you know, uh, I, that never stopped me in my career in science, people recognized that I was telling the truth about something I had seen for which they didn't have an explanation, and it never stopped me in my career, um, especially when I moved to the, uh, to the United States. Uh, my first job in the U.S. was in Texas, at the University of Texas, and as, uh, at uh, the observatory there, and we were working on NASA projects, and I was told, uh, you know, if you want to continue working on UFOs on your own time, uh, be, feel free to do that. You can use the computer, you know, you can use the facilities to, to, to do this research uh, on your own. Okay, of course, I was not paid to do that, but I could do, I had the freedom to do it 
on my own. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe I'll ask you the question to be realistic. The UFO, like the, of course, we'll go for the science of it, the material, let's, let's be covered later. But now the question is, there's physical component and non-physical aspect of this subject. And that's why some people get ridiculed, but there is also confession that there are unidentified flying objects. The question I want to ask you, do you think this is really something could be developed by advanced technology in aerospace company or other countries? Or do you think it is something as believed extraterrestrial like vehicles or something we're not aware of? It would be something like illusion, like something in consciousness as human being who saw this phenomena. So there is many component here. Which one do you think is relevant since you highlighted that it is like control system or control mechanism. And if you can also explain why do you, what do you mean by control system mechanism? Well, there are many things in, in your question. Um, I don't want to speak from the point of view of belief because I want to think about the problem as a scientist. So uh, in science, you make a hypothesis, you look at the data, whether it matches the hypothesis or not, and then you, you go on revising, you know, what your, your tentative conclusions about the phenomenon. And of course, you cannot do that alone. You can only do that with a team of colleagues who know more than I do about physics, you know, about, uh, uh, about optics, about consciousness, and so on. So that is what I've tried to do. And as you may know, I, I've had the opportunity to, to join teams that, that have been doing that systematically, you know, gathering data from all over the world. So the, what you can say about the phenomenon is the, a, a, a lot of the data is genuine. There is very little jokes or hoaxes and so on. Uh, and, and those can be screened fairly, fairly easily. Most of the data is genuine. It comes from people who very often have been affected in their life by what they saw, um, as I was. Um, then you have to look at the first, you know, the first attack is on the physics. You know, do we have traces? Do we have materials? Do we have physical proof? That, that something has been there. And now we have hundreds of cases where there were traces on the ground that have been studied. You know, later we'll talk about the cases in New Mexico, you know, uh, the case especially in Socorro, where, which is a, has been investigated by the U.S. Air Force uh, and to some extent by the FBI, where the traces were preserved and materials were were saved. We don't understand how an object could have landed there in those conditions and could have left those traces. So the question, if, if the phenomenon appeared today, uh, if it started with the Nimitz, for example, the observations of the aircraft carrier Nimitz, and there was nothing before, you could say, well, maybe there is a a country that's ahead of us, maybe it's Chinese, maybe it's Russian, uh, you know, because the, you could, you could uh, produce the electronic images, you know, with the kind of technology we have now. So it could have been something like that, although we don't believe that that's the case because there were other, you know, other conditions of observations, but, but you could speculate about that. But when you look at cases in the 1980s, the 1960s, the 1940s, you know, like, um, you know, like Trinity. Uh, in those days, no country on earth would have had the capability to build something like that. The phenomenon has been consistent physically. You know, it centers on relatively small objects, objects the size of this room, you know, uh, uh, maybe 40 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet in size, uh, that weighs several tons, you know, 10 tons, 15 tons, uh, that leave deep traces on, on the ground, 
that leave materials behind and and we have tracks now uh, infrared photographs and films and so on of those so there is an abundance of physical data so the other question that you pose which is i think very relevant is what about human consciousness what we see what the witness sees and describes is it really what the object is or the is the object really uh, maybe belongs to a different category of objects. You know, here, look at all the, the devices we're using. We're using, you know, advanced microphones, advanced cameras, and so on. Uh, we can manipulate images. So what people see may not be, people don't see the rest of the studio. They don't see if there are other people here. They don't. So that's the same thing of a witness who is surprised by an observations he or she may not be aware of all the components. And that, to me, that's where science comes in. That's where we, we need to become, not simply to get the witness to fill out a questionnaire, you know, but we need to know a lot more. And that's what I've been doing, you know, actually all over the world, in the U.S., in France, but, uh, you know, also... Uh, in, in the Soviet Union, in the days of the Soviet Union, and in Argentina, in Brazil, and Mexico, uh, in Costa Rica, and so on, uh, looking across cultures at how people were uh, impressed by what they saw and how they reported it. And what strikes me is that this is a, a constant across all the different cultures, all the different languages. People are affected in the same way and they describe it pretty much in the same words. So that is one of the one of the most interesting aspects of the phenomenon. So it takes psychologists, sociologists, and and physicists to, to work together, and then maybe a, a few computer scientists like me. Um, there is a I'm in France today because we're preparing a meeting of the CNES, you know, the French Space Agency, which is a government agency, is organizing a meeting in Toulouse at their headquarters with six different countries, you know, um, Holland, uh, Sweden, uh, uh, the UK, France, of course, Germany, Spain, and Italy, you know, to compare notes about the phenomenon. So it's now recognized by scientists, you know, especially space scientists, that there is a phenomenon that has the same appearance and the same capabilities, the same uh, parameters all over the world. So it's time now for science to really get involved. Mm, great. So maybe I'll just confirm, you have little speculation that some aerospace company hold advanced technology. You, it is unlikely to you, do you think, that they have this kind of advanced technology working that. You don't think that's the case. Right. The again, I, I it's not what I think; it's what the witnesses tell me. Yeah. The, what the witnesses tell me and what we're recording is a type of object that doesn't seem to be um, uh, to operate under gravity the way we understand gravity. As you know, in physics. Gravity is one of the big unresolved problems in physics. Um, the uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics uh, are in contradiction in the subject of, uh, you know, the, the theory of gravity. And we certainly don't have anything that could weigh 20 tons and could just leave the ground without a noise, hover in the air and disappear on the spot, disappear, you know, without going away, just vanish in midair. We don't have any capability of doing that. Interesting. So what do you mean about a control system or mechanism for someone first and listening about this hypothesis that you told this phenomenon is more like control system? What do you mean by that? So my, my main approach is using uh, what I know and what I've developed in computer science. And Computer science can, can be of, of help to other types of, of scientists by 
looking for patterns across you know, across cultures, across time, and across space. So that's what I've been trying to bring to the problem, to, to, to bring to my colleagues. Now, the, when, when I look at the structure of the phenomenon, it's a series of very intense waves, you know, I intense concentrations of cases over a particular area for, say, three months, for example, and then it, it tends to disappear. And then a couple of years later, there is another wave, another peak of observations somewhere else in the world. And we've been documenting these waves or these peaks of observations in country after country after country all over the world for the last 70 years. Now, the only thing that this resembles is um, what the psychologists call a, a pattern of reinforcement. If you, you know, if, if you give a, a banana to a, to, to a chimp, you know, they, every time the, the chimp does a particular test, you know, and is successful with the test, like the, you know, the, the monkey will push a button, for example, and you give it a reward. If you do that every time, after a while, the learning will stop. Uh, you know, learning what button the animal has to push. Well, it's the same thing for humans. You know, we learn certain things, we learn certain things in, in school, and we are rewarded by degrees and, you know, by uh, a better salary when we grow up if we, if we learn properly what we've been taught. But there is a limit to what we can teach using that kind of reward. A better kind of reward is uh, uh, doesn't reward every type of right behavior. The, the, the way to enhance the behavior of learning is to do it randomly. So every time a child, for example, does, does something good, uh, you might give a reward to the child, but uh, there are also times when the child did it right and you don't give a reward to make sure that the, the, the learning is embedded deeply in the consciousness. So this is, you know, straightforward psychology. This is not something I, I've invented. This is well known since the 1930s, you know, 1940s, um, in, in psychology books. But that seems to be what the phenomenon does. You know, it, it doesn't mean that it's teaching us something, but it, it means that we have to analyze it, not one observation at a time when people do, but we have to look at the patterns and we have to look at the, how the pa patterns behave in time and in space. So to me, you know, in the US right now, Everybody is talking about the Nimitz because, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, there are lots of people involved, many airplanes, the, the most modern airplanes that the country has, you know, and very, very highly trained pilots who are obviously telling the truth about what they've seen, okay? And what they've seen is different from anything else that they've seen, okay? And it's recorded by radar and it's regarded, recorded by very, very good infrared cameras that are used in combat. So uh, th that is important. But to me, that's not enough. Uh, you cannot base a conclusion on that, a scientific conclusion on that. You have to look for other cases like it. And in fact, there are other cases like it in the archives of other countries and also in the, in the old archives of the U.S. Air Force, for example. But nobody looks at that because we, you know, we live in a, in a culture that's only interested in what happened yesterday. Okay? Uh, that's based on television, of course, and on the movies and so on. We're, we're very, we have very little memory about what has happened over a long time. And I think that's where people like me can make a contribution because we've been developing those databases, you know, in several countries for a very long time. And we can look for those correlations. Yeah. 
Interesting. Maybe I'll ask you about the Tic Tac. You, you mentioned this example, and we really saw that's happening. Uh, we're very interesting, very interesting, and there's many questions pop up here, but there's two possibility, maybe advanced technology, which we think we don't have it still like the gravity components, or maybe it's religious experience, like something, some people, like I read comments, like it's just like demons, angels, that's aspect, or maybe something extraterrestrial technology. Maybe the first question, why is this happening? I mean, it is not that frequently happening. It's not many cases. You can correct me. But why do you think if we have the two possibility, like something, religious experience or a spiritual, or maybe something like the possibility, extra technology, why is this happening? I mean, what's the benefit behind that if we have the two scenarios? Um, in, of course, in developing a database, if you do the job properly, you cannot stop with just the physics. You want to know what are the surrounding conditions, you know, what are the patterns, what, how is the, the human being, the human witness affected by what he or she has seen. Very often, um, I, I was working with cases where children were involved, and children are very good observers because they don't have a preconceived con idea of what they will see. Uh, in many parts of the world, uh, if you see something very unusual, especially if there are creatures involved, if there is a, a form of life, you're right, people will think in religious terms or in demonic terms. Okay, And so I, I have, uh, I, I've been careful to uh, interview people in that, you know, in that range, and also to look at religious apparitions. For example, the apparitions of the Virgin, uh, n not simply in Catholic countries, but there have been apparitions of the Virgin in Egypt, for example. There have been apparitions in, uh, you know, in other parts of the world. There were apparitions in, uh, in Latin America at the time of uh, you know, the conquistadors in uh, uh, coming to South America or Central America. And I have been, I've tried, I'm not a specialist, of course, in, in the interpretation of religious traditions, but I, if I look at it purely on the part of, uh, from, from the point of view of the information and, you know, stripping away the belief People are free to believe, to attach a belief to what they have seen. And we all do that, okay? especially in terms of crisis or in terms of being faced with something unknown. You go back to a belief system, which is a, a, human, a normal human behavior. But when you look at the, just the physical characteristics, the apparitions of the Virgin at Fatima, for example, in Portugal, and there were a number of them with increasing intensity and increasing number of witnesses. They, it, at first, there were three children. At the end, there were 80,000 people watching the, uh, the apparition. Uh, I've gone to Fatima, you know, placing myself in the same conditions they would have seen uh, at the same place. Uh, I've, I've tried to do that across cultures, you know, uh, I've had the, the opportunity to travel to Saudi Arabia, for example, in my, in my work. Uh, there were uh, a conference on uh, the future of industry, the future of business a few years ago in Riyadh, where I was invited as part of a panel. And uh, the, I, I spoke to people I, I knew there in Saudi Arabia about the tradition of the jinn. Well, the jinn can take many forms. They can be material, they can leave traces, they can also be invisible, they can also move things in ways that seem magical. So there is a pre-existing framework in our cultures, you know, both in the Western culture and you know, in the in the Muslim or and Arab Middle Eastern cultures, and also in Russia, and also in China, and also in Japan, 
about uh, these other forms of life. That's really interesting. Maybe I want to ask you before closing the religious part and going to physics and material, which is really interesting. Did you have any correlation with the Vatican? I think that's one of the questions people are asking if Vatican holds some evidences for something like what we mentioned. Do you have any involvement with the Vatican here? So I've had no direct contact with the, with the Vatican. Uh, I've worked with uh, researchers in, in the U.S. who actually went to the Vatican and discussed the subject with, uh, with, you know, with officials there. The, my understanding, I, I cannot speak for the Vatican, but my understanding is that there is a, a, a new approach to uh, this kind of experience, this kind of sighting, uh, within the church today uh, that um, is, is open to the idea that uh, there could be you know, intelligent races throughout the universe. Now, that, of course, raises a question of, uh, of dogma. You know, I, I, I know the, the notion of dogma is not as important now as it was before, but there is a question of belief. And, uh, f of course, for a long time, uh, the belief, uh, certainly when I went to church as a, uh, as a young Catholic boy, you know, the belief was that um, we had been created by, by God, you know, as a, as a uh, unique um, form of, of life and intelligence uh, and uh, that the, the, you know, the earth was special in that sense. The, the 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 Bible uh, says seems to say something different. It seems to say that you know the the legions of God came from throughout the universe and so on. So that's op that opens the, uh, the 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 idea that there are there is a higher level of consciousness throughout the universe. Uh, the current Pope has been very clear in saying that. If, if he met an extraterrestrial and that extraterrestrial wanted to be baptized, that he would baptized, baptize it, you know. So uh, th there is a, a profound evolution of, of belief. Um, the same thing within, I think, within the public. For a long time, you know, the public was uh, uh, scared of the subject. That may have been a reason why the subject was kept so secret in, in the U.S. That you know there was a, a, a very strong religious uh, presence, especially in Congress, for example, that did not want to infringe on religious traditions and religious freedom in in the United States. So the the subject was was seen as something that was marginal and what was should 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 be kept you know should be kept quiet until there was an explanation for what people saw uh, now that's much less important because you know we have f about 400 over 400 men or women have gone into space so the idea of going into space is is not as loaded you know in in the public imagination as it was you know 50 years ago so uh, now those things are more accepted, uh, I think, by the public, and that's why I think things are a little bit open, a little bit more open, including in Congress. Yeah, interesting. So before now, I think you have to go for technology and the material part. But before that, uh, I want to ask you a bit about Bob Lazar's story. What do you think about his story that involved in? Area 51 is four, is four, I think, in part of Area 51 and the technology of the flying saucer. And I think when we try, you are in Joe Rogan Experience podcast and he was also there in, uh, in another episode and he was mentioning about the technology, maybe similar to what we saw on Tic Tac in the, in the famous video. Uh, I, I'd rather not talk about Bob You don't want to? No. But uh, it's bullshit, do you think? I respect uh, it. I, I, I just have... No, no opinion I want to okay, I give. Okay, maybe 
I want to ask you about the material, the, the samples you have. Can you tell us about the, the material you have so far? It's 17 samples, right? So, so for a long time, people have reported after a sighting, being able to pick up something that looked strange. It didn't look like a normal stone or something that looked like metal. And uh, a number of scientists have gathered this, so there, there is a lot of a lot of material has been gathered going back to 1947 and, and now before, since uh, the Trinity case was in 1945. The, uh, those, those traces were analyzed, usually, uh, for in normal chemistry. Uh, the, the only, uh, the, f the first attempt to analyze it at the level of the isotopes uh, came at Stanford University about 30 years ago with Professor Sturrock. Peter Sturrock is an astrophysicist at Stanford. I worked with him and for him for two years on studies of the sun and uh, studies of plasma plasma uh, research in the, you know, in the universe. And we published a number of, of papers. He was also very interested in UFOs. So he published a number of studies, uh, especially of a case in Brazil at a, a beach town called Ubatuba uh, on the coast of Brazil where people had seen an object that exploded and showered the, the beach with very bright material. That bright material turned out to be magnesium, uh, in a very pure state. Now, uh, you, can, you can buy the purity standard of magnesium from Dow Chemical in the US that supplies laboratories and hospitals with pure elements. Uh, but this was more pure than the standard of purity of magnesium. And uh, we think the, the observation happened in 19... 57, 58, 1958 in Brazil, okay? Why would there be extraordinarily pure magnesium uh, in, as a result of an explosion of, of, of a UFO over a beach in Brazil? So uh, there were a few uh, samples that were gathered that were uh, given to uh, to an organization in the U.S. called APRO, A-P-R-O, and some of it was given to Stanford, Stanford University. And the results are still inconclusive about the isotopes, but there seems to be something, uh, something unusual about the isotope ratios. And of course, you can, you can always hoax a, a chemical, you can blend chemicals, you know, to create a hoax, and say that it came from a UFO, but you cannot change the isotope ratios inside the atom of magnesium. You know, you, you cannot do that unless you have, you know, a, a nuclear, essentially a, a nuclear plant at your disposal or a nuclear process. You know, the first uh, element that was altered that way was uranium, you know, for the atom bomb. And you can buy altered elements at a very, very high price. For, for example, for tracing uh, the, the uh, uh, organs within the body, you know, tra tracing biological processes within the body. But those are milligrams, you know, of, of material. Here in Ubatuba, there was a lot of material. I have the samples from Professor Sturak, and we are studying them in the lab with new devices, a new generation of, of, of machines, uh, that, and, and we own the machines. So it, it's relatively, it's not easy. I mean, it takes a lot of work, but we, we are doing that now. We have a number of materials from other cases, some of them going back and some of, their, some of them very recent. Um, like materials that were gathered, you know, in Socorro and uh, in other other recent cases. So that's one part of what we're doing. 
we want to know if the uh, the, the the people who have uh, developed you know the craft have uh, uh, altered the the basic elemental conditions the basic atomic conditions inside the uh, the metals that they are using we have um, for a long time it was very difficult to publish that kind of study because the most um, scientific opinion was um, you know was negative didn't believe that it was important but we have now broken the the system and we we have published a um, a, a paper on the analysis of of a particular case in the United States that was accepted for publication by the top review in astronautics in the world. So we hope that that will open the possibility for our colleagues in science, you know, in other countries to to redo the kind of thing that we've done and to publish their results. So it's it's a big. Uh, it's a big break. That's through. interesting. Maybe I want to ask you about the intelligence and the design. Since you mentioned the isotope, maybe if we have the same material in Moon or Mars, the same component, but the way we alter the isotopes, how how do we see the intelligence in doing that? If we can elaborate, that maybe surpass our perception of material science. So. so uh, we, we understand isotopes, we understand the structure of most atoms, you know, in the table of, of atoms. Um, again, the, the first time it was done was, you know, in the Manhattan Project for the, the first atom bomb. Um, the, uh, it's difficult to do with uh, significant amounts of material. So uh, one aspect of it that's important is if we found a, a fairly large amount, you know, uh, dozens of grams, hundreds of grams or kilograms of material that has been altered in terms of the atomic structure, the nuclear structure, then that would indicate a technology that's beyond what we can do on Earth. You know, so. Uh, or what we can do certainly within you know the countries, uh, the, the current uh, civilization we have. So it would assume another civilization more advanced than us. Um, the it would not prove a space origin necessarily, because the the elements are the same throughout the universe. So if you brought me a stone from Mars and I analyzed it at Stanford or some other place, um, we probably would find the same ratios of the elements. If it was altered, it could mean that there was a reason for whoever produced that material to alter it just like we did for the atom bomb. You know, for the atom bomb, it was altered to enhance the power of the explosion. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the uranium was enhanced, uh, uh, but at an enormous cost. Okay, um, if if you found it today, that would lead to a number of questions about why somebody would want to do that. The reason it's altered in the in the body in certain certain operations is to be able to trace uh, very subtle reactions within the body that could, you could recognize because the, that isotope has been changed. Okay? Uh, so of course you would do that with very, very, very small quantities of, of, of material okay? that, could be, that would be radioactive, okay? but on very, very minute, quantity, minute quantities so you could be sure to trace it that way. Uh, the, we have no reason to alter the, the composition of chemical elements, you know, in industry today, other than for testing or for, for research, for scientific research. But on an in industrial basis, 
uh, we we really don't have a need to do that. So if we found something like that after you know the landing of a la- of a craft, that would be very significant. So I want to ask you in that case to solve this puzzle. You already was Gary Nolan, I think he, we had him in the podcast, and you working with him about the analysis of this material, and I think that's ongoing work. Uh, if uh, I understood from you, yeah. yes, uh, the. Uh, There are a number of laboratories that are doing that. Uh, Of course, you need a special lab. Uh, Dr. Gary Nolan at Stanford has uh, pioneered in uh, in the development of new equipment for medicine that is able to recognize elements at very high speed, you know, in the testing of blood and in the, the, the testing of other fluids from the body. So that, that's a, a, a very important development, and we have access to those machines. So in the paper that we published, we published results from two different machines, you know, so that there is absolutely no question about the results are. So the, the paper is mostly about methodology, about how we, you would do that. But now we're going to start applying it to Ubatuba again. We have new material that I brought back from Argentina. Some of it was, in fact, from Brazil, of course, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, it was gathered by a group in, in, in Argentina, and we have uh, access to their material. And then uh, we have, I, I have about 20 other samples that, uh, of course, we've looked at many others that we have discounted, but we're focusing on about 20 materials that we intend to, to be testing. And this is, um, you know, this is good science. I mean, it's mainstream science, but at, at a very high technical mm-hmm. level. Interesting. Maybe I'm going to ask you personally, do you think there is really advanced creatures like traveling over the space or from other planets? I don't know. Do you believe in that? If we leave the statistics for a moment, do you personally think Maybe I believe there's something advanced than human. Uh, do you think that possibility, realistically? There's aliens, if we say here, that term. So, so uh, if, I, if I remember my training in astronomy, um, you know, 50 years ago, we were teaching uh, in astronomy classes at Northwestern University, for example, that it was very likely that any slowly rotating yellow star, like the sun, the sun is a slowly rotating yellow star that's very stable, is likely to have planets, just like we have planets. And that it's very likely that some of those planets would be in in a range that is somewhat similar to the solar system. In other words, there would be something like air that could be breathed by, you know, a biological, you know, uh, being, a biological creature, and there would be something like water, okay? So water can only exist in a certain range away from the sun, okay? That would be true for, you know, throughout the universe. So if then you, you, you get to a very, very large number of potential planets within the life zone of the, that solar system or that star system. And this is just within our galaxy, and we know, you know there are billions of galaxies. So the probability that some of those would have developed life somewhat similar to us you know, is, is high. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that, that's the reasoning that leads you to that. Now the question is, would they be able to travel in space all the way to the Earth? Now I've done some statistics you know, about that. Other people have done it. I've, I've published those statistics a long time ago. There is a, a zone, some maybe a, you know, less than 100 light years or 200 light years from the Earth where you would expect if there were ETs coming here, they, they would probably come from that zone if you assume 
that they have to travel from there to here. That's a big if, because what if they don't have to travel? W what if they can do it like this? Well, um, when I talk to physicists today, they say that there, there, are, there is a possibility of other dimensions, and then you could, you could punch a hole, you know, in Alpha Centauri, and you could emerge through a hole, you know, between the Earth and the Moon, w instantly. And you would not have to cross the distance. So you would not have to spend years or centuries, you know, on a spacecraft at some fraction of the speed of light to, to, to get here, that you could get here instantly. But there are other possibilities, you know. Dr. Hynek used to say, what if there is another universe five minutes ahead of us? It would take five minutes to get here. Well, for uh, an advanced civilization mm -hmm. that has understood the structure of the universe, you know, uh, there, could, there could very well be another universe five minutes ahead of us. We would never see them. So uh, all those possibilities are there, you know. And again, um, there is a, um, uh, there are legends about that, and there are, of course, uh, you know, religious traditions about that. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask a quick question here related to what you mentioned. I think Donald Hoffman talked about that, where that we see the reality it is, and I believe that we don't see the reality as it is. I mean, as a human, we limit it. I think you agree with that. But do you think if this is really true, do you think this is, would define the God and religion and all that maybe not true? I'm not sure what you think. If we really have other civilization, other creature, do you think that's the religion, whatever the religion is, or our beliefs, or the God is not real? I'm sorry if that's offending question, but I'm, I want to ask you. I, I think there would be uh, a revolution is certainly in, in religious scholarship. We first we would want to know if we can communicate with them. We would want to know what is their concept of the universe, of how it was created. You know, in in physics, we have a, a particular theory or a number of theories about how the universe started. Um, then the Bible says. Let there be light, you know, that light was the first thing, which is also what physics is saying now, that it started with a big explosion of energy. Okay? And then there was an acceleration, there was the expansion of the primitive universe, and then there was the growth of the universe to the modern state of the stars and the galaxies. Okay? Well, um, this would not necessarily be a, a crisis. It would be a, an extraordinary opportunity for rethinking who we are, where we come from, and so on. But I think the, the other impact comes from physics, not from UFOs, but from you know, all, uh, you know, uh, academic physics that today says that we have to think beyond space and time. That space and time are secondary aspects of the universe. That, and they are just the way we tend to make sense of the universe. But that all of this isn't space and time. That all of this is sort of a quantum reality that we perceive as space and time. So if that's the case, and there are a number of theories, of course, that develop from that that are uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, and you know, I, I, my the physics I learned is a long time ago, so I'm I'm trying to relearn it with that kind of theory, uh, you know, and and educate myself about this. But this opens up all kinds of possibilities. So 
within that, the question is, uh, are there more developed forms of consciousness than we are? Well, you know, I certainly hope so. I think, I think nature is, didn't stop with us. Okay, nature in in those other, you know, realities would have would have had millions of years to continue developing. Uh, you would expect that some of them would have developed way beyond what we have had time to to develop. You know, as 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 humans, so their concept might would probably be you know, much more developed than, than ours. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it would not necessarily be a, uh, a source of conflict. I think it could be maybe a, a source of humility, which is something we need. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Maybe I want to ask you the missing pieces when you look at this overall picture, because I know some people still uh, maybe didn't get why we bother about this topic, maybe from technology, I think, what's so fascinating, and also leading to explaining who we are and if are we some advanced civilization exists, which is possibility, since we don't need this technology so far. But what is the missing pieces? And when you look for the keeping this secret for a long time, and I think you have been like decades in that, why do you think there is keep like this situation or observation secret or ridicule and i think even in academia for example Avelope he has a bold project as why this kept secret for a long time and what do you think besides your effort and gary nolan and Avelope to to really answer this question what is happening here is it technology what is this there are several levels in in your question um i've had the you know, the opportunity to work on a couple of projects that were technically were secret. Um, you know, the the Bigelow Aerospace uh, Project, BASS, you know, that uh, lasted two years, uh, was classified. Um, the, some of the results are, are still classified. And, um, you know, at the top level, top level uh, of, uh, of classification, and I, I've I think that eventually, you know, the, the material will be released, you know, as, as time goes on. But certainly the, the database that we built, for which I was responsible, um, was classified for good reasons, because it contained a number of records that had to do with testimony from human beings whose identity has to be protected. Some of them had medical conditions, that are covered by medical secret. So you cannot just throw it into you know, the public. Um, those, those records need to be analyzed and uh, you know, some, of them, some of them come from public records. So some of them are already public. But what, what we did to change the structure, you know, to make it possible to do artificial intelligence based on the database that that I designed, you know, th that is still, you know, covered by the project itself, and I, I don't disagree with that. You know, uh, this is, the, I think this is appropriate, and I think in time, parts of it or all of it will be declassified um, once the the privacy of the witnesses can be protected, okay, and once then other teams can start building those other levels. I'm very proud to have, uh, you know, been able to work on that. We ended up with 260,000 cases from all over the world, you know, all reduced to English and all reduced to the same structure. So um, that's one, one valid reason for uh, keeping things, you know, in an unpublished state until you, you, you can get it to the point where it, it can be open. There are other reasons. Some of the material, for example, from the Nimitz, you know, that has been on television and so on, but about half of the material is missing because, you know, and I've never seen it. Uh, the public has never seen it. The scientists who are trying to work on the data have never seen it. And probably the pilots have never seen it because it's, 
you know, remember there were new radars that were being tested by the fleet at that point. Those radars were classified. So the, the data itself that comes from a classified instrument is classified. So there, th that means that in order to release it, you would have to uh, reduce the data to a point where it would not reveal anything about the technology. So the technology would remain classified, but you could have access to the results, okay? The, the same thing for some of the signal manipulation that took place, you know, when, uh, when the, the signal is acquired, the, you know, on the infrared cameras and so on. That's very complex technology. So not all of it is when, when people make conclusions based on that, I think it's certainly premature. So th those layers are valid layers of interpretation because there may be a new instrument that wasn't designed to track UFOs, you know. It's designed to track an enemy aircraft, uh, including the, the infrared cameras, for example, that were built by the Raytheon company for the aircraft, for the F-18s. Uh, th those, those images are infrared images, you know, that that are designed to capture the temperature of an exhaust from an, an enemy jet. You know, they are designed for combat. They are not designed for physics. So um, the Raytheon uh, never denied that there was something unusual or unknown on the images, but they wrote a memo saying, pay attention to the fact that you cannot extrapolate directly from the data we give you. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe I want to go for the stories for the data, I mean the material, and one of the book, Trinity, I think you really explained a lot about it, and a very interesting, uh, the stories here in this book about the UFO and also for human experience. But what is special about the Trinity some people can relate to and how it's contemporary to ex answering the question, why bother by this phenomena, UFO? So I, I was invited into the study of the Trinity case uh, by uh, Paola Harris. Paola Harris is an Italian researcher who has traveled all over the world interviewing witnesses and, um, and, and presenting the the some of the best data about the cases. For example, she interviewed Colonel Corso. She has interviewed a number of uh, prominent uh, people in the military and also civilian witnesses in, in Italy. She's from Italy, but also in the United States, in South America and elsewhere. So she had been intrigued by the, the case um, in New Mexico that came out in uh, about 10 years ago from two, um, two men who uh, testified that when they were children, they were seven and nine-year-old, they were working on a ranch in New Mexico, close to the place where the first atom bomb was detonated, and they saw an object crash on their land. And there were witnesses to the recovery of that object by the army, by the American army. The case was completely unknown. And the first reaction of many people, including many U UFO groups in the US, was to, to ridicule the thing, to say, well, they invented it. Those, uh, those little kids, you know, made up a story. And, but why would they have kept it secret for over 60 years? Well, when you, uh, uh, Paola invited me to join her in the study of the case because there was so much, you know, material data and physical data and scientific data that we could get out of it. So we continued the investigation together. I've gone to the site for a number of days, five times, 
Uh, I know, you know, the main witness very well, uh, Mr. Padilla, uh, Mr. Jose Padilla, who grew up to be a, an officer in the Highway Patrol uh, in California, but has now returned to New Mexico, where he's from. Uh, he had fought in Korea, had been wounded in Korea. Very courageous man, very good observer. He is now in his middle eight, 80s, and uh, he has a clear memory of what he saw as a kid that we can correlate with not only with what his, the, the other child you know, had remembered and had uh, testified to as, as an adult uh, you know, recently, but to other conditions at the site and a number of different records. So we now have a complete picture uh, that we continue to, to work on, but we have a complete picture of what happened. What happened is that a, an object came out of nowhere. It was, you know, the size of this room, which is about the size of two trucks, you know, two. Uh, the, the object was about 15 feet, you know, three meters high, and uh, evidently very heavy. And it came out of nowhere and hit a communication tower that stood outside the perimeter of the Manhattan Project. The Project Manhattan was still secret at that point, although the war had just finished. We are two days after the capitulation of Japan, one month exactly after the first test of the atomic bomb at the Trinity site in New Mexico. So this is a very unique time in history for the first time in history, man has the capability to use atomic forces for destruction. For the first time, an atomic bomb has been demonstrated to the world. For the first time, it has been used in combat, in war, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Emperor of Japan uh, concedes, you know, uh, the, the Know, capitulates to the, the American army, and two days later, this object appears out of nowhere, destroys a communication tower just outside the boundary of Project Manhattan, and crashes on a ranch, on a property, on the cattle ranch in New Mexico. The, there is an aircraft that is coming in for a landing at uh, the base of Alamogordo, which is inside White Sands. White Sands is a very large you know, uh, desert area where the bomb was exploded. The first atomic bomb was tested by a group of scientists that includes the best physicists in the world um, and Dr. Enrico Fermi, Nobel Prize of Physics, uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, you know, the, le uh, the leading physicist in Project Manhattan, and a number of other scientists from all over the world who were fleeing, you know, Germany, were fleeing World War II in Europe and, and came to, to America in a project that was so secret that the Vice President of the United States did not know that it existed. It's the largest project in the history of man, not only in the history of war, but in the history of man. So the, the fact that that object appears out of nowhere and destroys that tower just outside Project Manhattan, and he's seen by that pilot who is coming in for a landing. The tower asks him to look at the tower because they don't understand why they've lost communication with the tower. He flies around the tower with his bomber, a B-25, a, a two-engine, a twin-engine bomber and uh, observes the tower, reports that the tower is broken, it's bent, and it's lost communication. He also sees fire in the, in the vegetation some distance away. He describes that there is an object there that looks like a big, uh, big egg. There's an oval object. It's not, not a flying saucer. It's an oval object. 
and he describes two little kids, calls them two little Indians on, with their horses close to where that fire is. So we have an initial report, which we don't have in Roswell, we don't have in many other cases. We have an initial report by you know, a, a, a trained pilot uh, coming in for a landing at Alamogordo that places the object, the fire, the destruction of the tower, and the two kids. So we, we have an initial picture of exactly what happened. In the investigation, we find that the, the object was not on fire. The, the vegetation was on fire, but the object was intact. So this was not a hoax. This was not just a balloon. This was not an airplane with a funny shape. An airplane hitting the tower would have blown up in you know 100 pieces. That object hit the tower, landed, essentially crash landed, but then was still under power because it, it dug a, a boulevard all the way down the hill for about 500 meters, made a turn, and stopped you know, against a, a, a berm in, in, the, in the landscape. The kids are there, and the kids are taking care of the cattle. They were sent there by their father to make sure that the cows were all right. One cow was expected to give birth. They have found the, uh, the, you know, the kid, uh, they, uh, the, the, the baby and the cow are all right. So they will report that to their father. You know, they know where all the cows are. The kids have binoculars to track the cows. The cows have brands. And it's very important to make sure that all the cows are there, that there is no animal with another brand from another ranch that has come over the fence. They're also there to make sure the fence is intact. They know how to fix. The, those two kids are very bright, and they are very good observers, and they know that if you see something, you, you have to, if you see an accident, you have to bring support to the people who may be hurt. So they go to the object. They see that it's open. One part of it has blown up when it hit the tower, and they see three little creatures inside, and then they get scared because the creatures are human, but they also remind them of a, of a sort of insect. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, about three feet tall, about as tall as the kids. They seem to be in great distress. They move back and forth inside the object, and they seem to be crying. And again, those kids are growing up on a farm, so they, they know, you know, the cry of an animal that you kill, for example. They, 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 are, they have experience with animals, and they don't know whether they are in the presence of some small, strange humans or, or strange animals. So they are not going to go inside. Their first idea was to go inside to see if they could help, but the little one is crying and says, I, I don't want to go anywhere near that thing. And the nine-year-old, you know, who is Jose uh, Padilla, who is still alive today, and we've developed, you know, a, a, a very open friendship and so on as, as a result of working together, um, would like to go help, but he will listen to the little one and decide not to go there. And he told me, you know, if I had gone inside, I probably would not, would be, not here. be here talking to you. It's interesting. I mean, maybe for the creature you mentioned, because this question about how human, uh, as we are developed, and maybe there is a possibility they have a combination of being human and reptiles. Do you have, based on what you witnessed, besides, of, of course, what we have a fact as a science, or maybe try to analyze that, this creature, is it, I mean, some people disbelieve, but because we didn't touch that, and it's not that common we can see that thing, but you have a drawing, I think, in the book to resemble that they have, like, 
insect-like and human-like in a combination of this. Do you believe in, in like its combination or how, how these things could develop if we just a theory like? So remember, this is where I, you know, I behave like an, an in, like I was trained as an information scientist. I, yes, I'm going to analyze a case. Again, we've gone back, we've looked at things in the landscape, we've, we've, we have found other witnesses who came in later and could describe the conditions of the site in later years and things that were found at the site by other people later after the initial case and so on. So I, I've, you know, I'm doing all that, I continue yeah. to do that with uh, Mrs. Harris. But I'm also looking for other cases that form a pattern with this one. I look for patterns. There are two other cases in which the object is egg-shaped and in which the occupants are three feet tall and look human and breathe our air, you know, which we don't, we don't expect extraterrestrials to come here and breathe our air. We expect them to be like we're going to be on Mars, you know, with a, with a helmet, with breathing equipment, with speaking equipment, and so on, antennas, and so on. Uh, they, here they are just wearing a one-piece suit, you know, but they have hands, three fingers, not five fingers, but but they have hands, they have two eyes, and evidently they breathe our air. So that the in in the case of Socorro in New Mexico with uh, Officer Lonnie Zamora, that's what he sees. He sees an egg-shaped object that lands on a very remarkable landing gear on uneven terrain, where an airplane couldn't land, a helicopter couldn't land. The object lands on that terrain. I've been there and I've, I've looked at the places. The, 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 the object is an egg-shaped object on four legs and there are two humanoids in front of it confronting Officer Zamora. They are three feet tall, they have two eyes, they breathe our air, they have a one-piece suit, you know, just like the case in, in Trinity. There is another case in, which is in France that I also know very well, a case in Valençol. And uh, 1st of August 1965, a, a farmer uh, comes out early in the morning to water the, 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 uh, the plants because it's going to be very hot, you know, in the south of France. In August it gets very hot going to be very dry. So he has both vines and, and other, uh, other plants there that he needs to water early in the morning. There is an object in his field. It's oval. He first thinks it's some sort of a helicopter. He gets near it and it, it, there is no way it's a helicopter. It's an egg-shaped object on a landing gear with a central, like a central pivot. And there are two uh, beings in front of it looking at him. He tries to get close to, it, to them to ask them what they are doing in his field because they are, they are destroying the vegetation there, they are destroying the plants. And th one of them pulls a little device from his belt, points it at the witness, and he becomes paralyzed in his own field. He f doesn't fall down. It's a, a kind of paralysis where he just can't move, but he's still standing. And they look at him for a while. They go back inside the craft. The craft takes off, disappears in midair. Disappears in midair, okay? The case in Socorro, the object took off with a tremendous noise, and then when it was about 60 meters in the air, stopped, you know, motionless. All, all noise stopped, and then it started flying away towards, um, actually towards White Sands, towards a mountain. So 
those two cases, Valenzal and Socorro, were not investigated by people like me. They were not investigated by, you know, uh, volunteers uh, who are interested in UFOs. They were interest. They were investigated by uh, initially by the police in both cases. So testimony was given to the gendarmerie, for example, in the Valenzal case, uh, by by the French witness, and then the the police called the air force and called the army. The people from uh, uh, in in the case of Socorro, the the, the people from uh, the the atomic project uh, came because they thought it might be some experimental uh, device that had escaped from that had gone you know out of out of the territory and that they could recover and they quickly came to the conclusion that it didn't match any technology that they had and they had the most advanced you know uh, uh, army uh, uh, lift uh, technology at the time uh, on on uh, on the base. Uh, there were three people from the FBI there. The FBI had no jurisdiction in a state case, in a, you know, a New Mexico case, but they were there and they had time, so they preserved the traces, you know, the way they would do it for a federal case. So we have very, very, very good description of the cases, you know, from the FBI. The, there were a number of materials that were recovered that have been analyzed in various ways and we're still getting, we're getting ready to reanalyze them because there was some, there were some official lies, lies about the materials that were covered by secrets. But we have part of the material so we're going to take it to a lab and we'll see what we find. The um, in again in all three cases in in uh, the the investigation was by official uh, state bodies. In France, there were five uh, five bodies of the French government investigated it. First, first the gendarmerie and the police, the French air force, French intelligence, and the French customs. So um, when you take those three cases together, you have a pattern. In all three cases, the object is um, the object is an oval, you know, uh, an oval shape, and I can I can show it I can show it to you. Uh, and maybe you can take that picture separately. But in all three cases, you have an oval um, object that had extraordinary capabilities of lift. Uh, in all three cases, we have a very good estimate of the weight, and the weight is in tons, not kilograms. Okay. The, the case in Socorro is of the order of 10 to 15 tons. Um, and the, we, we know the approximate case, the approximate weight in the Trinity case from uh, the testimony of the of the kids, because when the army came in, they came in with a large truck, a uh, kind of army truck that carries two tanks, mm -hmm. and they built a crane. Remember, we're f 15 miles away from any you know any big town or any medium town, so they have to improvise. They have to build everything there, you know, on on the ranch. So the, the army comes in with this large truck and they, they come in with a crane, with another truck with a crane to lift the object and put it sideways on the platform. So uh, if, it, if it had been a light device and so on, they would not have needed that truck. So that tells us that object was between two and five tons. Okay. So this is not a hoax. This is not somebody who, with imagination, who wanted to play a joke. And I don't think anybody would play a joke on a project that has just has exploded, has just exploded the first atomic bomb in the history of man. Okay. So 
even the idea that this would be Russia or this would be Germany, well, Germany is completely defeated at this point. There is nothing left in Germany. Okay, it has been bombed into, into, uh, into nothing. Uh, and Japan is not, has just surrounded, just, just surrendered. When we look to the 100 years of advanced in human technology, and by doing what you're doing now along others, what possibilities maybe would change us as a human in terms of technology, if we speak about technology? What would be if we imagine like we solve what it is, maybe it's physical phenomena, it's be other civilization, which is likelihood more to happen since we, you try to elaborate the points why shouldn't be other than that. What could be possibilities in terms of advancing human as we are, maybe technology, since we see there's a rapid change in 100 years, maybe you, you better to tell us you're also investing in companies and technology so you know better here. So we are led to that by, we are led to that by um, another question, which is how come nobody knew about, you know, how come nobody knew about uh, Trinity? Well, um, from the, the answer is easy from the point of view of the U.S. government. You know, Project Manhattan uh, owned essentially anything happening, you know, in that, in that area. So it was taken by Project Manhattan. They, they sent you know, a detachment of the army. It was brought back to White Sands. From White Sands, it would have gone to Los Alamos. Los Alamos is where the labs were, where all the atomic laboratories still are today. And some of the best applied science and applied physics in the world was there. So it would have been taken there. It would have been secret. Now, in the work I've done, I've worked with people who had access to classified information and so on. They had never heard of this particular case, this particular recovery. Uh, Dr. Hynek had never heard of this case. The, it's not in the files of the Air Force. Uh, you know, at the time, in 1945, there was no Air Force. There, was the, there were airplanes and pilots, but they were in army uniform. This was the Army Air Force was flying those, those planes. Okay? The, the Air Force was created two years later, in 1947, by President Truman. There were no flying saucers. Flying saucers are going to be described two years later by Kenneth Arnold over the state of Washington. Okay, so all those things have not happened yet. There was no CIA. CIA is going to be created in 1947. 1945, there is none of that. There is uh, the atomic secrets. And the object was, and I, in fact, we know that. It's not just my speculation. But the object was taken to Los Alamos and then became owned by under the atomic secrets. The atomic secrets in the United States are a separate type of secret from the ordinary clearances. For example, when I worked on the database, I told you, I, I had a clearance uh, under the normal type of clearance that goes confidential, uh, no foreign access, um, classified, um, you know, secret and top secret and then above top secret uh, for very special projects. Well, the atomic secrets are under R, P, and Q. They are not given to automatically into the, the other type of secret. So somebody in the Pentagon could have a clearance higher than top secret all his life and never know about something that's classified P or Q. If he doesn't need to deal with atomic materials or with the atomic bombs. So those, there is a very special, and you can understand why. I mean, the atomic secrets are segregated in a particular, in a particular 
type of lab, particular type of science. Uh, if, if you're working on you know, something completely different, there is no reason why you should have access to it. Then there are other secrets, which are the foreign diplomacy secrets, that again don't have any reason to be mixed in with the, the regular industrial secrets of, say, the development of a new airplane or development of a new rocket, you know, which are, again, are the, the Pentagon type of secret, the normal, the, the main type of secret in the U.S. Uh, the, the foreign secrets would have to do with, you know, what is, uh, is uh, uh, Brazil developing a new weapon secretly? Well, if we know about that and if it becomes important, somebody would brief the, you know, the president or would brief the executive about that particular development. But the rest of the time, there is no need to know that. The need to know is important in dealing with secrets. So of all the people I've known who had access to secrets, nobody had the need to know about this particular, about Trinity. And that's why, you know, nobody knows about it. The only, the other reason nobody knows about it is that the kids never spoke. So the question is, you know, and I'm often asked that. People say, you know, kids will talk about, you know, well, when on, on the second day, the, the, the father had reported, immediately had reported the, the, the information to the state police. The state police wants to go there. So the kids are going to lead, lead their father and the state policeman to where the object is. They call it an avocado. Of course, everybody speaks Spanish. Okay. And the, the uh, state policeman and the father go inside the object. The little creatures are no longer there. We don't know what has happened to them. We don't know if they escaped. We don't know if the a detachment from the army came in and took them away the previous day when nobody is there. We don't, we, don't, we don't know what happened to them. But the, uh, the object is empty. It's, you know, they go inside. When they come out, they are, and I remember, I remember Mr. Padilla telling me, you know, my father was changed. They had a completely different attitude. They said, they, they, they got the kids to sit down, and they said, you don't talk about that ever. Wow. It's not for us. It happened on our land, but it's not for us. It's not for you. It's for the army. It's for the government to do something. It's going to be secret. You don't talk. You don't talk to, your, to other kids in school. You know, you just, you just stay quiet about this. And where's the vehicle? That's the vehicle that's overseas. And where's the vehicle? The vehicle that's the oval shape. Is it? So do you the, know where it is? I, is I, I don't know. I, I don't have the, the that, object. I've where never had that kind of clearance. We know that the atomic secrets uh, are, go up to a certain level. This is, we, we know this is kept in a, 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 a classification that's higher than the atomic secrets. We know that because this was. Uh, stated to the head of the Canadian project when he asked, you know, ab about materials and so on. The materials recovered, you know, are classified higher than the atomic secrets. Uh, he, they, he didn't know about this particular case, but he knew about the recovery of objects of craft and so on. Uh, the other reason we know about it is that the, the governor of the state of Washington, Dixie Lee Ray, uh, was a woman, was a physicist, uh, who was very bright and created the Atomic Energy Commission. And she worked with one of the witnesses, Remy Baca, became a businessman in the state of Washington, became very active in politics, and helped her get elected to uh, as governor of Washington, mm -hmm. governor of the state of Washington. So. Um, he was close to her office and 
she showed him the report about Trinity, the, the, the case that he had seen as a kid. She showed him there was a classified report. She didn't let him read it, but she showed him. She went to a safe. She took the report, and she showed him the report. So we have these two different ways of checking what the little kids, who are now grown men, you know, uh, revealed, uh, you know, when they were in their their 60s, their 70s, their 80s. Quick question here about when you mentioned some of the things are classified, still classified, maybe because of national security, and this is totally understood. And another aspect you mentioned also during experience that the podcast that, for example, Patel, the company, maybe have some samples. I don't know if you can elaborate on that. So what I'm asking here, there's aspect you clarify that you can't release for safety reason. This is totally reasonable. But when you look to the data, it seems there's classified part, maybe companies like Patel, you mentioned you can elaborate, have materials. Yes. To solve this, imagining that we solve what it is, whatever it is, do you think this is something, maybe some aspects, I maybe mean, companies or government dominating this kind of knowledge, whatever it is? What do you think of that? So, um, Paola Harris has interviewed Colonel Corso. Uh, Colonel Corso was in the Pentagon, you know, in the 50s, and he told her, and he testified publicly, that he had been given a, a box where there were different materials. And the, um, he was given the instruction to give those materials to different laboratories, different companies in the United States where they could be analyzed. Now, the, what were different materials? And the, um, he was given the instruction to give those materials to different laboratories, different companies in the United States where they could be analyzed. Now, the, what, what he would do would be to go to a company like Lockheed, for example, and, yeah. and show them something that seemed to be, you know, aeronautic material. Or, and he would tell them that this is something we've acquired from, from you know, through our intelligence from a foreign country. Maybe we found this in Japan or we found this in, in the Soviet Union. And we, we want you to analyze it to tell us, you know, how it's made and what it is. They would not tell them that it came from a UFO. They would tell them it came from, you know, army intelligence. So, you know, it came from a spy somewhere, or it came from, you know, we bought it from a, a foreign agent, you know, who had this. Because they, because they, the UFO case was classified okay. higher than the classification of the scientist who was going to do the analysis. So, and they would go to a specific scientist. They wouldn't go to the company they would go to a specific scientist to whom they have access, you know, who is already vetted under the classification system, okay, but has access to the, to the instruments. Uh, uh, I, I knew one of those scientists, so I can speak about that, you know, he has been dead for 20 years, but he was the, the scientist who invented the coating of magnetic disks for the computer industry. You can imagine how many millions of dollars, billions of dollars his company made. And you can probably imagine which company, which company it is. I, I won't give you his name, but uh, he showed me actually uh, a, piece of, uh, a piece of rock he had kept. There were several samples, but they, it looked like a rock. It was actually a very sophisticated material that he could, he could look at the structure. He could not understand the structure. 
and that's a report that he gave. Uh, you know, they, um, but yeah, it, it would have been classified at the time. Uh, I, the, the, but there was no, he, he couldn't understand really what, why you would want that kind of, that kind of structure. Now, the structure is known now, I mean, it's not, not a matter of secrets, but that's the way the information was, was turned over to the, to American industry. So, and you know, that's what Colonel Corso described. So this is what, what would have happened, you know, with the material, including any biological material if there was my biological material, we come. Mm, interesting. Are you still chasing new material? I'm curious. Like, yes, yes. sure, sure. There were we. we, we the, the, there is material that we're interested in, going back into historical cases. Sure. Yes. Again, it's not clear that that material will prove anything in terms of. But to answer your question. That material could, in fact, inspire a new industrial process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the uh, so far, you know, it hasn't. Uh, people have said, "Look at the transistor." Well, we know where the transistor comes from. I've worked with some of the people who were there at the invention of the transistor. It's not that long. Okay. Uh, it's. You know, uh, we, we know where it was developed and we know how. The, the patent for the transistor is actually a German patent from 1934. 1934, okay? And it was a description of a process in physics, you know, of an interesting experiment that had no application, you know, because people were starting to think of developing glass tubes you know, to amplify currents. You've seen those old radios, you know, with the tubes. And, of course, the transistor was a revolution replacing the tubes with, uh, with semiconductors. But uh, the, the, the knowledge of the semiconductor process goes back to the 1930s. It didn't come from, you know, an alien coming out of a, of a flying saucer. We can we can trace that. The advantage of being in Silicon Valley is that I can I can find people who know ab about how those materials were developed, and so this is probably the best place to test, you know, n new materials, and that's what we want to do now. Um, yes, there might be patterns developed, but. I think my own impression, and we, we must do that because it's good science. I mean, what a gift, you know, if we, can, if we could find a material that just levitates by itself. You know, yeah. We could study it and understand gravity. But um, I think that the, the real origin of the phenomenon is much more complex. I, I think what we what we've recovered or what we've seen at at Socorro and Valensol and Trinity is a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that was shown is being shown to us, presented in a form that we can understand. But it's it could be part of a training program mm -hmm. to get us to think in other terms. Now at the at the end of Trinity, you know, it took ten days for the army to clean up everything in the in the landscape and put the lift the object with the crane and put it sideways on the trailer. The reason they put it sideways is that it wouldn't go under the road overpass if it had been standing up. So you know, the egg was turned over to the small diameter of the egg so that it could go under the overpass. So that tells you this was not some kind of, you know, hoax from the, the kids making up something. I mean, now, when it was there, um, Jose Padilla went inside. 
the the soldiers were away. You know, there was nothing more to be done. They were waiting for night to take the truck away. So the soldiers were at liberty to go have dinner. They went to d dinner, you know, nearby, and then they would come back at dark at night, take the the truck and go to the Trinity site. Um, the kids had time to go inside. What description inside? Like, if you briefly describe what is different about the perception of design could be enforced your claim here. So, so the, and I've, I've interrogated Mr. Padilla at length about what was inside. They, it, it, it seemed that the walls were metal. He could not see any juncture. He couldn't tell how that panel had been ejected, for example, by the shock. The, the, it was just smooth. There was a small dome on the side towards the back, not on top, a small glass dome, uh, about 60 centimeters, you know, less than one meter in, in diameter. Why it was there, nobody knows. There was no equipment there except one thing that he managed to get away from the wall, which was a sort of bracket, and we've analyzed it, and we think it was put there by the army. We think it was human. I, we don't think it was part of, of the object itself. The floor was flat. Now, that was important to me, that the floor was flat, because it means that there was a space of maybe 60 centimeters or 70 centimeters under the floor where the, the rounded shape of the underside would be. Now, since the, the, the object was on the trailer, on the side, the kids could see the underside that they hadn't seen before. So they, they looked at any opening, you know, any propellers, any jets, any, anything that could be, there was nothing on the other side. The underside was smooth, except for a, a, a couple of bumps in the metal. But remember, it had, it had gone all the way down the hill, and the underside was intact. I mean, it was scratched, but it was not broken. So it was extraordinarily strong. Now, to me, trying to analyze it, um, this is where the engine would have been, right? If it has an engine. We don't know if it has an engine. But we, we know it was under some sort of power when it went down the hill. So the, the engine would be contained in that relatively small space. We have no idea, no idea how it works. Okay. Now, somebody has that object. I would think that if it's Los Alamos, they would have tried to drill into it. They would try to do something. We don't know what they know. And we have no access to that. Again, it would not be under the normal secrets of uh, people in the Pentagon. It would be in the nuclear secrets, above the nuclear bomb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Do you anticipate how many years this could be? It seems there's something, but do you anticipate, like, besides your effort, and there is certainly classified saying that we don't know as a general public yet, so clear for national security here, but do you anticipate how many years this could be like, guys, this is a reality of these things. Do you think how many years or what does it take that we can have definitive answer about these things? Definitely it's not hoax and I, I agree with you, but how many years so that we can get this answer? That's the answer. Or maybe coming up with technology, advance our consciousness or perceptions that we can see the reality that we can't see with limited perceptions. Well, the, the, the important thing, and there are a number of examples in science of this, the, the important thing is that it's telling us that there is something else. There is another form of life. There is another form of intelligence. And it's capable of building something like that. So that is a, a new reality for men. Okay? So... That itself is important for scientists to know. 
because it, it, it releases their imagination in ways that haven't been released before. You know, for example, the, the, there are other examples in science where something was discovered by accident. Radioactivity was discovered by accident. Well, you, you discover radioactivity, you're going to do a different kind of science all of a sudden. Uh, there is a, you know, you, before radioactivity, the, the, the books, the scientific books said, we've discovered pretty much everything there is to know. We've measured everything. We've measured the universe. You know, we've measured the st how far away the stars are. Okay. You, another accident is when uh, the Andromeda Nebula was resolved into stars at Mount Palomar. And the man who observed that was, was a technician. It wasn't a great astronomer, okay, uh, who kept asking, how come there are stars on, on, on these plates, okay? And there couldn't be because uh, those, uh, you remember, those were called n a, a nebula, the Andromeda Nebula, because people thought it was sort of a cloud, you know, in space among the stars. Why shouldn't there be clouds among the stars, you know, clouds of uh, uh, hydrogen or whatever? There are clouds of hydrogen out there. So they thought it was just another cloud. Once you resolve it in stars and we can measure you know, the periodicity of those stars, it tells you how far they are. It tells you we are in one galaxy and there are billions of other galaxies way out there. You're not going to do astronomy the same way the next day when you go, when you go to the office. Okay, you're going to be thinking in a different way. This is what would happen once uh, some of that material is released. You know, it's, I, I'm not, I'm not saying there should be, you know, instant disclosure of everything because we don't really know what it is we would be disclosing. Okay, we, we, we really don't, if you ask 10 scientists, it would give you 10 different definitions of disclosure. The fact that the, that, you know, Congress has said that this was not a hoax or this was not a joke, that this was serious and this was real is a major disclosure because now scientists have permission to start study, studying it like, um, you know, Dr. Avi Loeb at Harvard is, is doing it with his own project. Uh, and like... Uh, you know, what, what is going on at Stanford uh, with Dr. Nolan, uh, this is not going to stop, okay? These are, these are scientists who are not going to stop uh, for, uh, you know, uh, bureaucratic reasons. So uh, the, this, the train is moving. Do you have maybe a quick question? Uh, any, oh, sorry, do you have any question about, uh, like, uh, remarks about academia quickly? Because Evelop was really mentioning that struggling to get an, enough attention, enough funding, and I think it's a privately funded that Paul Do you have a few comments about academia and be, yeah, dare to ask a challenging question and not be afraid to be ridiculed? Maybe that's the point. Maybe, do you have any comments about that? Um, the subject is going to be a challenge for academia because in uh, any American campus, the physics building is at one end of the campus and the sociology and the psychology building are at the, the other end of the campus. And they, they never meet. Uh, maybe, maybe at the Christmas party, you know, they, they meet and, and have drinks together. So uh, that will have to change if we're going to really study this phenomenon because the phenomenon cuts across many disciplines, you know, including medicine including, you know, ad ad advanced biology, which is what, of course, uh, what Dr. Nolan is doing. Um, it, it covers, you know, atomic chemistry, atomic physics. Uh, it, it covers uh, materials at a very, very high level. And so all these people will have to start working together. And they are, it's, it's very difficult for them to, 
to work together because they don't even have the same uh, the same terminology. To to they don't call even uh, materials. They don't call them the same way. Okay, so the it, it will have a profound effect on on science. To some extent, maybe there will be a step back from what where we are now with people of say, my generation, which is really, uh, you know, passing into history. <laughs> but uh, hopefully some of what we've found, you know, will be picked up by, by uh, you know, younger scientists who are, are now, you know, have, uh, have uh, the luxury of and the opportunity to, to, to study it. But to some extent, uh, th they will have to start from scratch because I've had the privilege of interviewing witnesses, you know, in the late 50s, in the 60s, of working with the founders of this research, with Aimé Michel in France, with Jacques Bergier in France, with, you know, people in England, with people in... Uh, in America with Dr. Heineck. And uh, all these people have taught me something, and, and especially the witnesses, many of the witnesses have died, many of the witnesses of that generation. In Trinity, we're very fortunate that uh, Mr. Padilla is still alive and remembers all of this very, very well. Maybe I'll take one of, uh, there is many questions from the audience and I appreciate uh, them sending them, but maybe for the time we'll take one and then we close for two questions. So the first question uh, from uh, Luigi, I asking that, do you have any particular opinion in Taylor, um, in Timothy Taylor from Diana Book, an American cosmic? He's, uh, do you have any opinion? That's the first question, yeah. Um, I, well, I, I know the book and I know her and we've actually worked together on some of the cases in, uh, in New Mexico. So I'm, I'm very interested in, of course, you were asking about the Vatican. You know, she's the one who went to, to the Vatican and spoke to uh, people there and researched the, the archives there. So she, I'm, I'm delighted with the, the research that she's doing. And, and so we're, we are staying in touch and comparing, comparing data about the, um, the, the belief systems and the, um, you know, that result from that. So it, it's, an, it's a very interesting uh, time in, in research where you have both, you know, uh, uh, research in physics and materials and so on, and, and propulsion, and you know access to those early, early traditions. As you may know, I've uh, published other books that have to do with ancient sightings and um, going back to the Bible and going back to uh, um, Arab traditions and Chinese traditions and so on about this. So, I, it uh, I'm glad that. Uh, uh, she is, uh, you know, being in, involved in that, and uh, you know, and uh, she has uh, also, of course, been very interested in in the materials themselves and how they relate to the whole history of of secrecy. So the second question, also, he asking in in your in your last book, Trinity, you has laid it to Reswin Verick theory as. Um, as a possible explanation for some of these phenomena. Yeah, can you elaborate on this theory, the Rizwin Verick theory? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to, to have that question because, uh, of course, his theory would resolve everything because he says that um, perhaps we live inside a simulation, inside a video game a very advanced video game, and that these are presented to us by the designers of the video game to see how we're going to be reacting, perhaps as a, as a great experiment, as a great social experiment, or as entertainment for them. 
you know, and that maybe everything would disappear. So in I've 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 written the foreword for Rizwan's book in French, for example, and and we've often discussed all this. I of course as a you know, as a computer scientist I'm fascinated with his uh, idea because in fact if you extrapolate you know the technology we have today i mean this technology that's surrounding us here in you know here in paris extrapolated by 5 or 10 years you know what do we have well we have the ability to create worlds to create universes to create devices that do things maybe uh, the ability to transfer our consciousness into avatars and and live through those avatars. Certainly, people have been speculating about this. And uh, if that's the way the world is constructed, then the in in one way, you know, my reaction is it's disappointing because it means we're just toys, you know, or. Um, uh, creations, uh, artistic creations. Uh, but in in another way, it's intriguing for a scientist because the question is, how would we test it? And maybe we would test it by, uh, you know, setting fire to everything and seeing how the system reacts. Or, um, you know, how would we make sure that uh, uh, that this is real? Uh, rather than being simulated by somebody, um, when you, when you were first exposed to uh, that theory, it's like a Gedanken experiment. You know, what if w the world was like this? So it's it's a way, just a way of thinking, that teaches you something about the kind of question you should be asking. But in another way, um, when you start thinking about it what are the reasons why it would be wrong? So you start saying, well, it would be wrong because, uh, you know, all the religions really say different things. Well, all the religions don't say different things. They all say the same thing, that we were created by something. I mean, the Hindus have some interpretations, and, they, uh, you know, they... Uh, uh, the Catholics have a certain interpretation and so on, but essentially is that there was an entity that had a high level of consciousness and created us. And, uh, you know, in the the Bible, I mean, he created other forms of life before, didn't like them, you know, destroyed them with the flood because he thought the experiment was wrong, and he restarted another experiment, and we are that experiment. I mean, that's pretty much what the Bible says. So Rizwan makes the case that if you read all those you know, religious traditions, they all say like what he says, that this is a simulation and that there is some higher level God that wants to see what we're going to do. So that you know that can take you very far, yeah. you know. It it can uh, it, it it can really take you to asking fundamental questions about you know how do we know that this table exists? How do we know that we exist? You know, and how would we manifest it? And what does it mean for the way we have to lead our lives and so on? So. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting hypothesis because it throws light on everything else. Interesting. Maybe, maybe also a part of a question also. L honestly, a lot of great questions, but we can't cover all of them. But the question is, if we come to understand that you or phenomena as a something operating as a control system, as you told us here, informing our understanding of reality, both adapting and shaping culture s schemes and spiritual beliefs. Then despite Jack's, Jack claims here, your claims, he doesn't want to def redefine God. Isn't that the ultimate result? So if, it's, if you live inside a control system, there, 
I, I had that discussion with Jacques Bergier, who was uh, the publisher of one of my books uh, in the 60s in, here in Paris. And he said he had been captured by the Gestapo in World War II. He was a French spy. He developed, um, a, he was part of a network that was uh, trying to find where the, where the Germans were getting radioactive material, you know? And he was also part of a, a, a secret organization that was trying to locate Pinamunda, where the V2s were being launched. He was captured by the Nazi and he was tortured by the Nazi. And as a result, he developed a very interesting personal philosophy. And he told me, a concentration camp is a control system. Um, you know, there are fences and you can't leave. And if you leave, somebody's going to pursue you and kill you. Okay. So it, it, it is one example of a human control system that we have built within our lifetimes. We have known there have been concentration camps that people were not allowed to, to, to leave. And the question you have to ask, if you, if you really think UFOs are a control system, is, is it open or closed? The Nazi concentration camps were closed. They were barbed wire and there were towers with machine guns to make sure nobody got out. However, they were also open in some cases. He says in one of the uh, uh, camps where he was kept and where he was interrogated, tortured, um, some, one day uh, the firemen of Zurich were brought in by the Nazi. The firemen of Zurich had, were unhappy and they had gone on strike. So, no, the, the firemen of Munich had, had gone on strike, forgive me. And they had been uh, taken by the Nazi and brought to the concentration camps for three weeks. After three weeks, they were released. They went back to Munich and they were no longer on strike. So he says, the concentration camp, I realized it was a teaching system. It was a school and it could be open. And so he said, I realized that the question about control system is, you know, how can you determine whether you're inside a closed one or an open one? You know, the firemen of Munich were brought in as guests inside the concentration camp. I was brought in as a prisoner to be tortured. I couldn't get out. So the, the same structure can serve two different goals. I, I've been thinking about that for 50 years. You know, what does it, what does it mean? Uh, you know, there are philosophies that say the earth is a prison. You know, the earth is a, essentially a concentration camp. Or we are there for, the Scientologists have said something like that, you know, that uh, we're kept, uh, there were um, philosophers who said, we're, we're kept as cattle, you know, we're, we cannot leave the universe. Well, there are other philosophies that say the, in the evolution, the full evolution of mankind, we will be able to become um, enlightened to the point where we can leave the universe. You know, the Eastern philosophies are different from the Western philosophies on that, that regard. But in both cases, it's a control system. So when you ask that question, it, it leads to pretty fundamental, you know, um, thoughts and types of philosophy. I, I don't have the answer. I, I conduct my life as if it was an open system. That, uh, you know, if I keep learning, uh, I may find, 
I, I, I have no delusion of finding the solution. But if I, if I keep learning and working with people like Dr. Avi Loeb and like, like Dr. Norland, maybe I can learn a little bit more about what, what life is all about. You know, and that's what, you know, the best thing I could do. Extremely interesting. The last question for you, what kind of truth you're looking for? You have dedicated your life with this, but what kind of truth you wish to, to, to have it? What is in the truth, ultimate truth you, you seek for so far? Um, you know, I've, um, I've worked closely with the man who was the father of the internet, you know, uh, or maybe the grandfather, because there are many fathers. Many people claim to be the father of the internet. But there was one grandfather, and his name was Paul Barron, B-A-R-A-N. Nobody remembers him. And he was a very humble, very humble man. He was at RAND, the, at the RAND Corporation, when he invented packet switching, which we are using now. Of course, in some many layers of packet switching, but it's still packet switching. And um, I, I worked for him, and I took over one project from him, a research project for ARPA. Uh, in 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 the U.S., um, I asked him that question. You know what all that, what does all that mean for you? You're not looking for your name to be known everywhere. You don't you don't expect people to build a statue to you as the father of you know of the internet. He said, in life, it's like building a cathedral. You know, many people, maybe several generations of workers will be there. And your, you know, you can be happy if you have been responsible for one stone, and that's what I did. You know, one stone. It's called the internet. <laughs> so I've never forgotten that, and that's my that's my philosophy. That's very inspiring. I don't know if you have any final words, like to say something. Maybe you think could be interesting to be shared. Maybe we didn't cover it. Uh, I, I do have, uh, I, I really think that everything I've done and you know, people of my generation have done is going to be uh, used and recycled and turned into something completely different. Okay? That's what happens in technology. I mean, we're not using the internet the way the ARPANET was built in 1965. 1965, okay, uh, was many generations away, and a lot of the early years have been forgotten. A lot of technology has been recycled several times, rebuilt several times, which is good. And I was delighted to have been able to contribute to at least a couple, of two or three generations of, of that technology in what I did uh, as an engineer and as a venture capitalist, you know, funding new companies to do that. So I think it's going to be the same thing. People will discover new angles, new ways of doing it. The one thing that I think everybody should remember is the humility, you know, that we need to have, have when we speak to a witness, like Mr. Padilla, like some of the, these other witnesses, because they, the reason we know this is that they have trusted us. And, you know, it all goes back to trust. And, you know, trust is is difficult to get, especially for the military. You know, they give you questionnaires you have to fill out. Uh, scientists love to develop forms and uh, all those databases. In, in the, the latest uh, databases that I've developed, they were open. They were not constrained by, you know, people could say whatever they wanted. And then, you know, we can build systems that will analyze that, but let's capture it on a human level. You know, a lot of uh, what I've learned, uh, I, I've learned, you know, was different from what, what had been written in the books and so on. And the reason I learned the truth is that the witness trusted me. There is, I'll give you one anecdote. There was a case 
in Northern California, beautiful area north of San Francisco, lots of uh, redwood trees and so on. Um, the witnesses were old miners, uh, a man and his wife who had developed a small claim and so on. And th there had been three cases of UFOs on their land. Okay? And this had been studied and somebody had written an article about it. And in the article, uh, they said that the, the object had taken off in a particular direction, which was you know, to, uh, open to the sky. I, I went there and I spent a couple of hours with them, and then I went back to ask them more questions. And I went there with my kid, with my son, and uh, we became friends after a while, you know, and they could see that I was really, really interested in what had happened to them because I could tell it had had a deep impact on them. They, had, they hadn't talked about to anybody because it had, again, affected their life, their, their beliefs, their, you know, a number of things. And I, I, I asked them to take me to that place among the, the forest where the thing had landed, you know, one time. And I said, you know, looking around, if it, if it took off in that direction, it would have had hit the trees. And they said, well, you know, it kind of hit the trees. And it went through the trees. Well, okay, so now this isn't some sort of rocket or some sort of helicopter. You know, a helicopter will crash if it hits a tree. Um, that I, I said, why didn't you tell that to the investigator who came here? They said, well, you know, we could tell he would never believe it because he was looking for hardware. You know, he was looking for some sort of super rocket. He was essentially had an engineering mind. We, we couldn't tell him that it went through the trees. But you asked a question, so we told you. So I think that's what we need to learn. And that is what bothers me with what's happening now in the US is that the, we're primarily going to look at the military cases. That's what Congress has mandated. You know, the pilots are going to come up and now, fortunately, they, have, they are giving them permission to speak about what they've seen, okay? Without stigma, without being degraded, without losing their position as pilots, you know? If you're a pilot, you don't want to be assigned to an office somewhere. You want to keep flying, right? So you're not going to talk about UFOs. Ever, okay? So when that stigma is going is removed, now you have another another situation. But now uh, we we have to think about and again the the army and the air force is great because they have all these instruments that can measure things. They have radar. They they have all of that. A uh, farmer in his field doesn't have that, but the farmer knows his field and he knows nature. He knows the clouds. He knows if it's going to rain tomorrow. He knows how the cows are behaving. That tells him something about what's going on. It tells you about threats. It tells, tells you about all kinds of other things that a pilot would never know about because a pilot is looking at a few instruments and the sky in front of him, and that's it. Okay? So the, the, uh, we should not narrow the... Uh, what I'm afraid of is that everything will, will be... The military observations, because they are so neat, observations from the last five years, because we have all this wonderful technology. The farmer doesn't have that technology, so it's going to be discounted, and it should not be discounted. We should go back to the last 50 years, and it's in the database. Now, most of those people have died. I have the privilege of having survived long enough to know all these people, and I can see people making hypotheses about the database that I can tell you are false. I can tell you it did not happen that way because I went there. And I spoke to the people who are operating that radar or the people who were flying that airplane back in Brazil in 1987 when there were ships 
flying ships coming out of the Amazon at night, flying out of the water of the Amazon. Okay, they saw that. They have pictures of that. Okay? You're not going to get that just by doing some superficial research, you know, as good as the research is at, uh, at Harvard or Princeton or Stanford. You know, we have to go beyond that. And I think this is a really excellent point to close this conversation, not only about yeah observation from different domains. So, again, I have a huge respect for you and such honor to talk to you and being here in person. Deeply appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.